Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, standing in here for Martin Bush who enjoys the perks of Canberra. Um, we, today we have our uh, own John Wilkins talking about comprehension and compression. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is kind of a work in progress, although I have presented it uh, at a, a conference already. This is an expanded version of it. If you want to see the slides again, there's a link there to a slightly earlier version, so you'll be able to uh, get the references that I'm going to be talking about. So the outline is that I'm going to look at understanding in music and business, and maybe in science, followed by uh, a brief overview of traditional accounts and recent work on the topic of understanding in science. Um, then I'll talk um, to no great resolution on the mechanics of understanding uh, and then present my own view uh, based on Kolmogorov uh, complexity and algorithmic information theory. Uh, a brief word about what the subjects are that do understanding. Uh, a bit of hand waving on some uh, uh, case studies that I don't have time expertise. Uh, or knowledge to present, then one I think I do, followed by some tentative conclusions. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a ride. Uh, I for uh, beg your forgiveness for the uh, heterogeneity of it. Uh, so we've always wondered about how to um, account for understanding complex issues, and here's a quote from Darwin regarding his use of a diagram, the only diagram he uh, published that showed any kind of phylogeny. Um, and it seems to me that what we have not really attended to until recently is, is the nature of understanding separate from the nature of knowledge. I'll explain why that is until fairly recently. In the last couple of years, there's been a book um, uh, published by, uh, that won the Lakatos Prize by uh, Henk Direct, uh, in last year, I think it was, or the year before, on scientific understanding. So it's become a hot topic in recent years. The reason I'm interested in it is because of the fact that uh, in the area of science that I focus on, which is biology, there's been an increase in the large, in the amount and quality of the data uh, that is uh, available that people in biology have to uh, uh, analyze. And it's always led me to wonder what exactly is it they're doing when they analyze this data? What sort of understanding do we get out of that? Do we just get knowledge? Do we just get results? Do we just get data sets? What's, what's going on? Uh, this is something you'll probably have seen quite a bit. Uh, TV shows where somebody looks at some very short sequence of uh, DNA or even worse than that, uh, uh, a 3D animation of DNA, and they'll say, ah, it's human DNA. Would that we were able to comprehend in that fashion? We, li we really can't, literally can't. On the left there is a sequence of genes. Now, that could be a sequence of, of um, genes from bacteria, humans, plants, uh, a virus, or uh, at least a DNA virus. Uh, and just looking at that, no understanding comes out until quite a few application, applications of technique and analysis are applied to it. So we're, let's just look at what people talk about when they talk about understanding. Start with Hempel, of course, uh, understanding the problem, uh, the phenomena, comes from explaining, which comes from knowledge, which comes from curiosity. And that, in a sense, is the standard view of scientific understanding. But as a uh, wise man once said, and that's not blackface, by the way, that's Greece. It's Joe's garage. He's supposed to be covered in Greece. Uh, Frank Zappa, information isn't knowledge. Knowledge isn't wisdom, and wisdom isn't truth. Now, he locates wisdom in um, music, but that we can pass that one by. This was taken over by, uh, taken up by a computer scientist, Robert Royer, in 1994, where he added, um, data is not information. So 
given these um, simplifications and these categories and so forth, I thought it was worthwhile uh, trying to sort of make a bit of a, uh, an entree into this. So, in order to do that, I thought that what I would appeal to is a uh, common diagram and uh, classification uh, that you will find in business management. This is called the uh, DIKW, Data Information Knowledge Wisdom Pyramid. Now, of course, <coughs> this is from business management and therefore is a gross oversimplification, and I don't expect you to take this seriously or literally, but it does raise the question, where is understanding located? Is it any one step, stage, level, or uh, the entirety of, of this pyramid of, of um, wisdom? And what I thought I could do here, and this is based on our photographer, Adam, uh, raising the question with me about a year ago, what is understanding, that forced me to start thinking about this. Uh, and uh, He raised it in the context of when does a uh, machine learning system understand what it is that it's learning about. This is a big issue in um, machine learning studies or artificial general intelligence. Um, but I thought it would, might be worthwhile turning it about and using the machine learning case as a toy example or a toy system which we can use to understand human understanding rather than the other way around. So, traditional accounts. Basically, since Aristotle, understanding has been seen as based on causal explanation. Uh, if you know the causes, you understand the phenomenon, right? But there are a number of, um, sorry, that's one too far. There are a number of um, uh, cases that you could plausibly say uh, occur where people understand things but not the causes. And uh, Christiane uh, is teaching a subject at the moment where astronomy is often uh, regarded, historically speaking, as an understanding of the phenomena and how they behave without an understanding of the underlying causal mechanisms. And this is also something you can find in biology and you can find in a number of other sciences. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, understanding has been seen as very important. The logical empiricists like Hempel um, adhered pretty much to the traditional view of um, uh, the Aristotelian tradition. Understand the causes, you understand the phenomena. Uh, what they did do, however, is reject uh, subjective elements like feelings of confidence or enlightenment, the eureka moment, that sort of thing. And one of the reasons I think they did that was to eliminate the subject or the subjective aspect of understanding. So they were looking for an objectivist, positivist, one might say, account of understanding. Uh, here's a statement of him, empathic uh, insight and subjective understanding provide no warrant of objective validity, no basis for the systematic prediction or explanation of phenomena. Well, you can see his agenda there pretty carefully. And I mean, I don't really object to that. So there's an objectivist approach which requires ultimately uh, to demonstrate understanding, whether or not this constitutes understanding, uh, is the ability to predict um, the phenomena, as, as uh, Hempel said, or to uh, explain the phenomena in ways that make sense of it. But again, it's an unanalyzed notion of what uh, making sense is in this context. And so it's a utilitarian or pragmatist account uh, of understanding. The subjectivist accounts are regarded in this tradition as merely psychologistic. They're, they're interesting in their own right, but not because they tell you what understanding is. Okay, so Hink Direct and collaborators, um, um, Sabina Leone and Kai Eigner, uh, have developed an account of understanding which boils down to three uh, criteria. One, come on, come on. Uh. Okay, one, it's got to be intelligible. I'll, I'll flesh this out a bit. It's got to be empirically adequate. Well, we've known that since uh, uh, Van Frassen's uh, uh, scientific image in 1980. Uh, 
it's got to be consistent. We'll look at what that means in a minute. And these are contextual features that are not subjective in the sense of having a learning subject. They are uh, contextual features of the discipline, disciplinary or professional's notion of understanding. So a profession can understand without a subject. And obviously there's a whole backstory of what uh, that means in uh, philosophy of science. So let's look at Direct's criteria just to set up a, um, uh, a backdrop to what I'm going to argue. For the intelligibility one is the one that interests me the most. It's the value that scientists attribute to the cluster of qualities of a theory that facilitate the use of the theory. And he basically says it's intelligible if they can recognize qualitatively characteristic cons consequences of the theory without performing exact calculations. Now, why would you throw that in? Okay. Uh, typically, when a scientist says they understand some phenomenon, what they understand is an exact model. They have to do the calculations. They have to do the statistics. They have to do the analyses that provide it. So intelligibility here is something more than knowing or having a successful theory or a successful ex explanation, according to direct. It's become something which a scientist can recognize. As far as uh, empirical adequacy, um, I'll get back to this, but I, th I think we've all got a pretty good understanding of what that might be. Um, but consistency is also interesting. A phenomenon is understood scientifically, if and only if there's an explanation of the phenomenon that's based on an intelligible theory and conforms to the basic epistemic values of empirical adequacy and internal consistency. So these are his criteria. Now, this has generated a lot of debate uh, and discussion, and I think so far as it goes, it's quite good, but I'm left still wondering what some of the key terms are uh, that he doesn't really expound on. Uh, and I still don't understand why this is explanation, uh, this is understanding rather than explanation, or understanding rather than knowledge. Okay. Note that it is passive, the scientists recognize, but they don't do very much in constructing understanding. Okay, so what's going on here? It's generally not discussed much, in, uh, despite the fact that both Locke and Toulmin had books entitled Human Understanding. Uh, it's not generally a, uh, a topic in epistemology, so far as I can tell. There may be specialist uh, discussions that I've not been able to find, but uh, generally it seems to be uh, one of those intuitive notions that people have. Um, and maybe this is because we just don't have any mechanistic uh, model of, of understanding, which is one of the reasons why the machine learning literature is so interesting, because there there's a mechanism. And it's not exactly an easy mechanism to just look at and understand. There's that, I can't avoid the uh, recursion there. But, um, these are simple systems, you know, like a, an artificial neural net is generally a three level, you know, six to eight input nodes, one output node, three layers. Uh, it's not terribly complex, but human brains are way more complex than that, astronomically more complex than that. So maybe if we could understand what's going on in machine learning, we could understand what's going on in our cognition when we understand understanding. So I'm going to appeal to uh, uh, some um, aspects, some underlying theoretical and, and techn uh, technological aspects of machine learning. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, we'll ignore for the moment the subjectivist accounts. So how do we approach it? Okay. One of the things you can say about machine learning is it's mechanical. Right? There's no denying that. It may be that you um, don't know how it works in a particular case. Uh, there's a domain of machine learning called deep learning where the system is actually too complex to uh, decompose and to follow the workings. But you know that it's composed of artificial neurons, you know the overall architecture of it, you know the data that's gone into it. So you can pretty well say whether or not you can, and again, this 
recursion, self-reference, whether or not you can understand how machine understanding is going on, um, you know that there is a mechanism there and that it's a Turing mechanism, Turing machine. There's no subjectivity in the, required in the sense of uh, an experience or a perspective, but there is a subject, there is a learning system. So if we take learning system as a generic notion, we can uh, ap apply it to uh, uh, human beings and also apply some of the theoretical tools that have been developed for uh, um, algorithmic information theory. Knowing systems uh, is the generic thing I'm going to talk about. All right, so before we continue, this is all scene setting. Uh, there's an old distinction in physics, which is not so uh, consistently used these days, between a kinematic and a dynamic uh, uh, description of things. Kinematic in the 19th century sense was a description of motions without a consideration of what the causal forces were. Whereas a dynamic uh, uh, description described the relationship between forces, the causes, and motion. I've just put a Wikipedia entry there because I wanted to do what we tell our students we can't. In short, this is a distinction, a well-known distinction, between a phenomenal account and a causal explanation, but it's not entirely clear what it is that uh, is a phenomenon. And I'll come back to that. So we can understand, we can explore the problem of understanding in a knowing system by going from a kinematic account of human beings to a dynamic account of machine learning systems and use that as an analogy to explain uh, understanding in human systems. Okay. Uh, just move past this because I'm not quite sure what I meant when I wrote that. All right. Now, let's start with pattern recognition. If you've got an artificial neural network system, one of the things that it's used for quite effectively is recognizing patterns in data sets. So I first came across it in the context of optical character recognition, where you scan uh, some text and it converts it to ASCII code. Um, but I also came across it in the context of understanding protein motifs in biology. Uh, a friend of mine across the road at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute used to use those systems to try and find classes of, of um, um, major histocompatibility complex molecules in order to predict what different molecules would be able to do by grouping them together into similarity classes. He had mixed success. That's another paper. Okay. So a knowing system has a limit in their working memory. This is a concept from educational psychology that uh, students only have a certain amount of ability to hold in memory and process information. It's been generalized in a lot of other fields, particularly in uh, primate social dominance theory, but Again, this is not relevant here. A knowing system has to deal with, as um, um, a number of people have, uh, good Geiger Enza, uh, for example, uh, have had to uh, deal with, is noisy data sets and uncertainty. When you've got a noisy data set, you have to eliminate the noise. And the only way to do that is through various statistical and algorithmic information theoretic uh, approaches. Uh, the other one is uncertainty of measurement, which means that we can't necessarily um, say that our measurements are accurate, and this is a, a known problem that goes right back to the very beginnings of statistics, uh, falls under a topic known as Fisher information. So given that, once your data set gets too big, you're going to stress the system's ability to process and hold in memory the data to do pattern recognition. Now, I can do a pattern recognition with three data points. That's quite nice, quite simple. I can do it maybe with five or six. I start to have problems when I get to the hundreds and the thousands. And if you're going to deal with something like DNA, you're dealing with about three billion, uh, independently of which um, species you're dealing with. So 
What we do is we outsource pattern recognition to uh, tools. And these are generally statistical tools that do regression analyses and give you nice uh, trend lines that you can use to understand the relationships between types of data. Or maybe you'll use a, a machine learning classification system like an artificial neural net and you'll come up with these diagrams which are themselves highly contested whether or not they actually display anything that people can understand. Uh, or perhaps you will use something like um, distance analyses, um, uh, state space models and so forth to uh, you know, look at the relationships between the phenomena, the, the general classes of phenomena. Okay, I don't need to go into much detail about this here, but I want to point out that you don't need quite so much memory and cognitive uh, processing power in order to interpret and retrieve a pattern, particularly if you are trained in interpreting those patterns in a discipline. They become, as it were, second nature to you. I'm going to present the uh, uh, phylo phylogeny example towards the end, which is the part of science I know best. Um, but what that means is that a pattern has information that the data doesn't. Now, what do I mean by information? is that a pattern allows a, a knowing system to settle on a state. Uh, it's a property of the state of a knowing system. It's not some um, uh, broader communications theory uh, account that I'm looking at. So a machine learning system, it's a Turing machine by definition, and it follows, even when we don't know it, for example, in deep learning or in human cognition, uh, there's an algorithm in a data set that generates the output pattern or phenomenon. Okay? That means that in the event that we have understood or at least we have known or learned about some phenomenon from a data set, there's an algorithm that can do that. I'm not suggesting the algorithm exists for reals in our human uh, minds, only that it can be analysed in that fashion. Um, and consequently, the information content of the data set, of the phenomena, the pattern, is the complexity of the data set and the Turing machine that generates it. This is uh, generally known as Kolmogorov complexity, and I'll get back to it. There's two types of um, complexity here. Uh, one is when you have a lossy compression of the data to the pattern, then you have less information in the, or less complexity um, in the pattern than you do in the data set. So imagine, for example, uh, that you have a photograph and you uh, export it in two formats, JPEG, which is a lossy fo uh, format, and PNG, which is a lossless format. Uh, JPEG will show artifacts and, and false uh, patterns that are not there in the original data. PNG will not. Uh, Lossless compression is obviously the most accurate, but it doesn't therefore give you the best uh, model of, um, uh, for understanding. It doesn't give you the, the compression that you might need. So if the algorithm is a compression algor algorithm, and by definition the worst compression is the data set itself plus a print or display command, uh, by analogy when we generate a pattern such as a regression curve, we're compressing the data down to something which we can say um, we can comprehend, which we can put into working memory and apply um, analytic techniques to, whether it's ours or machines or something like that. So that summarizes the complexity of P is the shortest program in bits in some language that generates the, uh, the pattern or the phenomenon. Now, um, this is based on the work of a couple of uh, one Russian, one American, both with Russian names, uh, uh, information theorists, uh, uh, Andrei Kolmogorov and Ray Solomonov, uh, and has been taken up by other uh, people, in, in, um, such as Gregory Kiton. Uh, the idea here is that you can think of the information content of anything as a computer program. 
the shortest possible computer program. You don't necessarily know what that is, but the complexity of that program is the length of the shortest program, whether or not you know it, uh, in some language that generates the string. The most complex string is a fully random one. Um, the working memory therefore becomes the largest random string that it can hold in memory while applying functions to it. And it's therefore contextual on what functions you want to apply. So with human memory, uh, our working memory has to allow for quite a large set of cognitive operations on the data that we might have. So there's a trade-off that comes out of that. If we conceive of ourselves as knowing systems like machine learning systems, the information in our data is the program that generates uh, the re requisite lossy pattern or a loss, uh, sorry, lossless pattern or a lossy pattern that is no more lossy than we need it to be in order to grasp the, the nature of the phenomenon. So there's no subject. There's a, there's a um, machine learning system, but it's not subjective, it's not its experience. It's not an objectivist account because it doesn't rely on the truth of the data or the accuracy or precision of the data or any kind of um, uh, direct referentialist account. Um, it's likewise um, uh, related to the informatives, informativeness for the system itself. So it's relative to the learning system. Uh, and the tractability of inferences increases, the ability of our, uh, learning, our machine learning slash human learning system uh, increases as the complexity of the information that we're applying our cognitive processes to reduces. There's got to be some sort of a trade-off. Put another way is um, that uh, compression of data is a lossy process in the, in the main because what we want is the ability to do more things with the data than just reporting it, okay? Um, why do we do this? Uh, that's another talk, and I think it ties in nicely to contrastive explanation, but the information that we have sets up the range of possible states uh, of outcomes that, that uh, the system might do. All right, in short. So, Solomonov held all inference problems can be cast in the form of an extrapolation from an ordered sequence of binary symbols. Uh, what that's basically stating is that we can re-describe an inferential problem in infor information theoretic terms and the operations that are uh, employed on that sequence of representative binary symbols. So let's look at it this way. Here's a data set, there's lots of it, we've measured it, presumably there's some error in the measurement, there's some noise in the measurement, there's some imprecision in the uh, use of the uh, instruments and so forth, but nevertheless we've got a data set so we apply processes to correct and account for these things and we come up with some sort of uh, regression line or um, uh, what you might think of as a kinematic account. From that, a, a kinematic description. From that we come up with a kinematic account where we have some formal description of uh, uh, the state space of things that are being measured. At this point we've got kinematic rules and we've compressed it down as far as we can and still have informativeness. And once we've got that, the next step is to look at the forces uh, the causes that, that generate these curves. So at least in the first three, and I'm not suggesting that this is a necessary sequence, but these are precursor logically, precursors to understanding, um, we have had a compression from a noisy data set to a much simpler curve. And fundamentally that's how I see the uh, uh, DIKW only now it's a DIKU uh, pyramid working out. Um, so I'm not, as I say, suggesting that this is a, um, uh, a standard sequence or method or anything like that. I'm thinking here in terms of it being logically dependent upon. 
Good. Okay. So, subjects. Well, what is it that's doing the understanding? What are the knowing systems? Um, initially, I thought it was just scientists. I thought, you know, we understand it when any given member of a discipline understands it. All right. may, it may be that only five people in the world understand quantum theory, um, but so long as those five people understand quantum theory, we understand quantum theory uh, sort of by inheritance. But then I thought, okay, well, yes, there are particular scientists, but there are also disciplines and sub-disciplines. Um, I've got uh, a friend who used to actually be my staff member who did um, uh, some 3D animation of DNA molecules being uh, duplicated. And he went to all of the people working in the field worldwide and he, he generated his animation based on everything they told him. And then he took the animation back to them and they mostly said that's not how it works. But that was exactly what they had said and the fact was they couldn't interpret the information that they had in terms of the actual animated dynamics that he was showing them. Moreover, he predicted some aspects of the, uh, um, the process of, of duplication uh, which didn't get discovered until a few years later. So, you know, his understanding in many ways was better than the experts. They were used to thinking in terms of two-dimensional cartoons such as get published in textbooks or in papers. And here he comes along with a four-dimensional representation. Not only the three dimensions, but an animated version of it based on physical properties and actual structural uh, uh, properties. So it seems to me that the, there have to be cases where even the best informed scientists in a discipline don't understand the phenomena that they themselves have uncovered. And that has to be true because scientists very often don't work out the implications of what they've discovered until some time later. So it's not like just knowing the uh, properties of, of DNA molecules or, or uh, you know, the cellular soup is enough to give them all of the implications. They have to work it out. Research groups, much the same. People have uh, enormous knowledge on the behaviour of uh, amyloid plaques in um, um, uh, Alzheimer's. Turns out it may not be the uh, amyloid plaques that cause the damage. They might be an effect. So here's a discipline, an entire research group, research program predicated on something they don't understand. So I think, in fact, taking a machine learning model as a toy model, you can apply this to both individual and collective knowing systems and subjects. And that's something I haven't seen dealt with in the literature. Cool. So, we can say that Professor X understands a phenomenon or that a discipline understands a phenomenon independently and those two things don't correlate. Does this mean we have actual Turing machines in our head? Uh, no, I'm just talking about an abstract way to describe the problem, the way artificial neurons are not the same thing as real neurons or neurons. I think my spelling is archaic there. Okay, so here's the hand waving. Case studies I don't have time to talk about. I think you could apply this to gas laws. Um, you could apply this very much to the periodic table, uh, given that mostly the original periodic table was done simply through experimental uh, techniques within the lab, uh, followed by a theory of valency, then uh, electron shell theory, followed by quantum mechanical causal accounts. Um, the understanding proceeds apace depending on what people can do with it and the tools that they've got. Mendelian genetics starts with a phenomenal uh, account of factors, as Mendel called them, becomes uh, population genetics, where the term gene means a heritable trait, becomes molecular dynamics, where you've got an underlying uh, causal process. Uh, theoretical ecology is another one, and tectonic drift is another one. But I'm obliged to give a case study. And I'm running out of time, so I'll be as quick as I can. This is a phylogeny circa 1940. And by phylogeny, I mean an evolutionary tree or an evolutionary relationship 
diagram. They used to be done qualitatively and subjectively, largely by paleontologists who um, used only a few characters to draw up their relationship diagrams. And um, uh, this was big, uh, based on a small data set and the expertise of the taxonomist. Now, one of the problems was that there was a real lack of rigor in the way that they, uh, the underlying formal theory of this. So it was never entirely clear what you could do with this. In the 1960s, um, phylogenetics became mathematized under the term numerical taxonomy, uh, which was supposed to become more objective and less dependent upon the biases and the internal politics of paleontology, uh, but which unfortunately failed abysmally because it turns out that simply using any data, which is what they were basing it on, total evidence they called it, um, people were setting up principal components and they just, you change the principal components even slightly and you got different groups. So while it might have been uh, objective in terms of its analyzing of the principal components, there was still a strong subjective choice problem there. And um, again, it wasn't an extensible uh, approach. So in the 1970s, we began to do, or 1960s, we began to do what's called phylogenetics or phylogenetic systematics, also known as cladism for those of you who know it. And uh, this, be, this, I won't go into full details. Those of you who know it will know it. Those of you who don't won't. But the data sets that it started to deal with were actually quite simple. They weren't much better than the paleontological data sets. They would use uh, a process called DNA hybridization, where you would uh, see how much uh, would, um, when the DNA was melted, how much would actually bind and how much wouldn't. And you would end up with a single value to uh, identify the similarity of DNA, uh, which was a single number representing billions of bases. But they would generate up these um, uh, classification schemes. Uh, and Sibley and Alquist, who did this in the late 70s, early 80s, before the rise of fully molecular genetics, uh, uh, phylogenetics, uh, argued that you know, the DNA comparisons see the same cluster of species that are seen by the human eye. In other words, uh, you can understand it pretty much as a, um, a slight revision to what paleontologists had done in the 40s and 50s. Bang. Suddenly you get stuff like this. This, by the way, is the re latest revision of the Sibley and Alquist uh, taxonomy, and it's based on full genomic sequences. Or rather, in this case, on sequences of segments of the DNA. So it's still a, class a simplification of the actual DNA. They use a, uh, a stretch of uh, DNA called 16sRNA, um, which is a mitochondrial gene. And they introduced the notion of molecular clocks. So you'll notice that this one's got a barely visible uh, geological time scale down here. And they've actually assumed, given a certain amount of change per thousand or million years, that you can put the speciation events back into the different um, periods. This is highly questionable, but uh, has been done quite a lot. Now, there are problems with this. One is this. You can only get these diagrams if you can compare the amount of change or the types of change between homologous genes or homologous molecular sequences. But one of the things that happens when genes are uh, reproduced is occasionally you get duplicate copies and those are not active genes. These are called paralogous, not homologous genes. And if you are using a paralogous gene to set up your phylogeny, then what you've got is um, a, a fake phylogeny. It's not, not true because an unused gene can change much more rapidly uh, than uh, a used gene. Uh, this means that you need to have um, a statistical analysis. You get right back to this notion. You know, DNA is not a magic molecule. It doesn't give you uh, instantly uh, clear information data sets. So you've got to statistically analyze uh, the, the data. And that, that plays out in two ways. One is that um, you can get genes which cross the phylogenetic groups. So this species might crossbreed with this one. 
Uh, that's a ridiculous uh, example, but go to ducks and galliforms. Um, they'll have sex with anything pretty well. There's a famous paper of a duck that spends 18 hours trying to mate with a mallard, a male duck tries uh, to mate with a dead mallard of a different species simply because it's fallen in the presenting um, uh, form. So uh, there's hybridization like crazy, which means that the DNA is sometimes excluding the, the, the sort of simplified models that we look for when we're looking for phylogenies. So what do they actually summarize? Here's my interpretation. Cladograms are B trees, as a computing person would say. They're binary trees. As much as possible, they try to show the structure of the data. Okay? And they are then interpreted as uh, relationship diagrams, and from that, people interpret them as um, uh, ancestral or evolutionary trees. So you see here is a, uh, uh, a cladogram for a group of deep sea fishes that live off the uh, coast of Australia, and the ones with the weird fishing uh, lures. And you can see that for the group up the top there, there are four different um, topologies that could be interpreted from that data. So it represents the analyzed structure of a very large data set. We need this to be able to make sense of the data set and to understand the uh, organisms that are being looked at. And no, you can't um, eyeball a DNA sequence and tell what the species is, but it's worse than that. You can't even align two sequences by eyeball, partly because of this um, uh, problem with uh, pseudogenes, the paralogy problem, but also because you don't necessarily know where the start and stop parts of the alignments are and consequently uh, I, I was at a conference earlier this year where taxonomists were complaining about this as a major problem with molecular phylogenies. Okay, moving on. So the bigger the data set, the more compression of the data is required for someone to be able to understand the biological relationships that they are trying to do with this data. And that's why. Okay. So final uh, slide. Um, we've, we've had a lot of talk about big data and how important it is. I think this overlooks the fact that we've had big data for a very long time in the form of censuses. Right? So it's not as uh, broad as big data is today, but we've always had it. And so when we get a total census, do we simply look at the data and say, hey, we understand now who all the people are? No, what we do is reduce it. We compress it to trends, thresholds, averages, economic activity markers, uh, and so on and so forth, in order to be able to, to comprehend it. Right? So, even the very notion of empirical adequacy becomes a statistical property. Because the more data you have, the more impreci imprecision in the measurement is magnified. Now, Fiona, you might have some things to say about that, because I'm now talking way outside my area of expertise. But uh, it seems like that to me. So to understand, compress, but compression isn't ipso facto comprehension. Okay, conclusions. This is my slogan. Science is the, an attempt to, under, to express the greatest amount of empirical consequences in the fewest terms. So there's a trade-off uh, between uh, precision and detail and generality. Understanding therefore sets and constitutes empirical adequacy, the, you know, the notion of Van Frassen, the idea that something scientific uh, is more scientific the better it accounts for the data. Uh, well, I think it also, we also have to bear in mind that we use compression techniques in order to uh, even determine whether something is empirical. And I'm skating over so much there. Generalization, I think, um, particularly in the sciences which are doing a lot of classification, um, I think the more generalizable a, a term is, the better for, you know, by term I mean a, a, a value, a variable, 
uh, that you assign values to, uh, the, the better for the science, uh, the, the better for in, um, amplitude in, in inferences, and uh, causal explanations, which are pretty much Dereg's three criteria restated. So I think the um, initial epistemic activities of measurement analysis and kinematic generalization all involve com uh, compression so that we have uh, the ability to put it into working memory, whether that's institutional or individual, in order to comprehend the things that need explanation through causal me uh, mechanisms. It's a kind of pattern matching, pattern recognition, and it's the basis for amplitude inferences. Okay, so big data is not in its own right a good thing, so there. Okay, acknowledgements, Adam, for raising this with me. Uh, various people who have discussed these issues with me over the years. Uh, Marcus Hutter uh, is a Monash... He's now working at Deep Mind. Right, okay. Uh, he has uh, had a similar idea, but I have his verbal permission to present this as my own, and once he'd heard it, he probably would agree. Um, and I have to thank my cat, who is my muse. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we have about a lot of this is useful knowledge and in the business world, in that uh, very often even algorithms that have become listed public companies, for instance, a company called Guru, there's an algorithm that looks at seven eight factors and can choose people for jobs much better mm -hmm. than anything else, and it's quite clearly available. Now, even in the work of Daniel Kahneman, his and previous work, they're saying that with five factors, very often you can explain most of the useful things that you want to. But we're all fully aware that when we do these things, it's useful knowledge, but is it knowledge? Um, can't solve that right this second, but yes, I think it is. I think um, if you give up the realist assumptions or the referential veridical assumptions of, of older ideas of knowledge, uh, I'm a pragmatist. I think that uh, if it makes a difference, it does so reliably um, in a complex domain, it's definitely knowledge. At the very least, it's knowing that. It's very useful knowledge, yeah. yeah. Sorry, knowing how. Uh, it yeah. may not be knowing that, but it's definitely yeah. knowing how. But very often you come across situations where you, a, a disruption occurs because there is a breakdown in the data or the world changes and it's not explainable anymore. Yep. That's probably not true of uh, biological systems or physical It's absolutely systems. true of biological systems. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. often said, uh, the, the, so are you familiar with the GRU problem? Yeah. Uh, this is the idea that um, uh, you can have a predicate GRU, which is green if it's before a certain date and blue if it's after. That's what they call a, a broken predicate or an unprojectable predicate. Um, what speciation if not a GRU predicate? You know, the idea that it was a species of X and now it's a species Y. Biology does that all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you get changes in population structure, in gene structure. There seems to be nothing which is consistent for, you know, across the whole of biology. So, yes, um, things change all the time. And I think that's part of the uncertainty uh, that Guy Garenza and co are talking about. The world doesn't behave nicely and neatly, so you have to be able to adapt to it. That's my view. Only perhaps at the chemical and maybe the physical level it does. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Well, we don't know. There's, a point <laughs> in, there's a point in chemistry where it starts to become very particular and non universalizable okay. And, you know, I think that's where you start getting biochemistry. There's no reason to think, for example, that any of our biochemistry will apply to uh, creatures in Andromeda. You know, um, chemistry is a universal, presumably, under certain circumstances, but biochemistry, maybe not so much. Um, how much of it, of the, the lack of understanding of things like that, is because we refuse to admit that our use of natural language was 
live with and everything else is just another formatting device um, and therefore it never um, that we've kind of because it's what we interchange it's an interchange method rather than an accurate and, and because we have we're, we're as humans we've got this colonization by a system that translates everything into words um, and into linguistic expression because we it kind of it loses a lot of the natural animal understanding that most creatures have to function sure. in their life. Sure, I don't think anyone really thinks these days that you can capture everything with language, uh, or at least not natural language. Yeah, but, but how hard is it for us to kind of actually put that aside? That's a, that's a psychological question, I think, rather than a, a sort of theoretical one. I don't know enough about psychology. I know that I have real problems thinking in formal terms. Um, Christiane? Just to follow up on that, a lot of the compression techniques exploit our visual sensibility. So no one really would ever try to describe the periodic table, whether it was Mendeleev's back then or ours today, in natural language. Like, actually utter the propositions of all the types. But by seeing it in the particular visual form it has, it actually does the job of compression better. So we have adapted various, and many of your examples were visuals. Yeah, yeah. Because, they're, they're, because for pattern recognition, that's where we work best. Yes, although, I mean, we must obviously do pattern recognition with auditory uh, processing. True. Rather, I mean, the very fact that you can identify when my words begin and stop. True. When, if you look at the waveform, there's no clear break. Right. <laughs> you know, you're doing massive pattern recognition just sitting here listening to me, whether or not you understand anything I say. So, uh, look, I think representational problems are ubiquitous. Nevertheless, whatever representation scheme you are using, whether or not it's verbal, visual, uh, symbolic, mathematical, logical, whatever, can be cast in terms of uh, information theoretic strings. So this is a general treatment of information that Solomonov and Kolmogorov have put together and which has been uh, worked on over at Monash University by uh, a fellow called... Um, David Dow. David Dow, thank you. Uh, and, and more recently, our, our uh, mate Kevin Korb. Um, and um, it doesn't really matter what it is. It can be a picture, it can be a, a series of measurements over time, it can be anything you like. What we don't have access to is a neurological representation. No, and I'm not sure that would help us. Yeah, I don't think it would help us because in the end, I think this is a, um, um, a behaviorist paradigm rather than an internal comprehension paradigm. It's not that there's nothing going on in the head, but what makes it a case of understanding is what the output is, in my view. I know that's not a popular view these days. Output can be behavioral Behavioral output. Symbolic output, uh, the ability to make use of it in some fashion. Um, yes. Yeah. If I if I can just barge in there, yeah. first of all, if you say anything can be represented by an information string, I think any art historian would say no, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's just wrong because you can approximate a visual through information string, but you cannot. You actually have an information was put in there very much. There is no lossy. Uh, information string representation of a visual, unless it's a digitally produced visual, and of course it, it is. Yeah, if it's a uh, photograph. But, but what, in general, is understanding representational? Because the way that you have presented it in, from machine learning, it seems that there is always the representation inherent in the understanding. You cannot be sure you've misunderstood. Yeah, look. I don't take a representational approach on this, but yes, there is a sense in which there is a representation. There's an encoding of the data. Um, and you've got issues of resolution. You want to take the art example, right? You take a good, high-quality photograph of a painting, right? Do you have the uh, information? No, because there's also the structure of the painting. There's the, the cartoon on the canvas. There's the... Uh, material it's made from, etc. But you can, to some uh, first approximation, represent the data as a binary uh, 
sequence. And I would suggest that no matter how much detail you go into, you always can do that. So yes, the artist has a representation of the data maybe in their head, right? They see um, Miro in one way, another person sees them in another, uh, and uh, how much they attend to the detail, how much they attend to the, the art itself, plus the context and so forth, doesn't really matter because in the end it can still be presented as an inferential process on a set of data. I think I have to say I don't buy the, uh, the assumption about the admission of data. I mean, you can, of course, represent, always represent them as data, but there will always be a, will be a loss unless you yeah, start yeah. working with the data. Look, look, I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that you know, we, we can ever have a perfect and complete description of any phenomenon which is where I would start to talk about contrastive explanation. There are things that are salient and things that are not. Uh, you know, if I'm going to explain the weather, the fact that there's a, uh, uh, a gust in the quad doesn't make any difference. There are things that I leave out and things that I include, and that's a much more general issue. But once you allow that, once you allow that there are salience criteria, professional contextual, disciplinary criteria, I think the, the rest of that goes through. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So, quick question. I was wondering if you could comment on um, whether you believe that this particular theory of understanding um, how how useful it might be in, in doing history of science. So, Christian mentioned the, the periodic table example. I wonder how how um, I guess historically relevant this this way of understanding actually is, or how particular this might be to the the kind of the current time in which we live. Um, and, and whether you could project it backwards and, and, and sort of posit it as a, a, a historical theory of understanding of which have any Well, uh, it can't be a historical because ultimately everything we do is evolutionary. But um, for the perspective of, of looking at how things were done in the past, I do expect human beings have used the same cognitive machinery. But this is uh, culturally economically, environmentally, politically, uh, contextual. And so it'll play out in different ways. It's not supposed to be a complete explanation of why Kekul was able to uh, come up with a benzene molecule uh, from, the, uh, from having had a dream. Uh, it's a generic account of any act of understanding will have to uh, include some sort of uh, reduction to a comprehensible uh, problem set, comprehensible data set, comprehensible set of operations on which you operate. Yeah. Now I'm doing this particularly in the context of science and uh, we're over time so I won't talk for very much long. Uh, and of course there are going to be social and humanities based exceptions to this. But I do think that with suitable adjustments you can make it work. Okay, we just have this room for another 10 minutes but we are officially over time so anybody who wants to leave is more welcome to leave, but before that, before everybody leaves, uh, just uh, thank John so far. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, but there was a couple of other questions already. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, thanks for your presentation, John. Um, my question is a, comes from a wider perspective. Uh, don't you think that um, the more, um, and I can see that you're actually uh, deploying a, um, a critique machine learning in your presentation. But don't you think that um, it will be helpful in your enterprise actually to adapt a more performative understanding of science, which is actually technoscience or science and technology studies in mounting that critique of... Um, of um, well, how would, you, how would you do that? I mean, from what yeah. foundation? Um, the only account we have is either psychology, cognitive psychology, or educational psychology, if you like, uh, of understanding, or um, machine learning. I, I don't know of anything else that really helps elucidate it. Well, um, uh, let me elaborate first on what a techno-scientific uh, way, um, 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 uh, way of seeing things is. I see techno-science as a um, a system of uh, an analog system that um, is closely related to society and nature. It does not actually 
view, uh, have a view of dichotomizing science and technology. Well, I is certainly this don't. technology hmm. as embedded in, uh, in, in the practice of, uh, practice of science? Well, I certainly don't dichotomize it. I don't see that science and technology are sui generis categories. I think um, uh, like they shade into one another. Uh, and sometimes they are the same thing. Um, the course that Christiane uh, is teaching at the moment, which I'm tutoring in, has just moved on to questions of the ability to make instruments of, of high precision in the 18th century French con context, um, uh, which ties into things like imperialism and, and so forth. I think um, um, you might be misunderstanding what I'm saying if you think that I am excluding uh, these things. I'm looking at uh, what we would paradigmatically call science, but that doesn't mean it doesn't apply elsewhere in, you know, mutatis mutandis. One, one particular aspect you can actually look into is differentiating what data is from information. Um, data is actually comes from binary digit, uh, zero and one. Information is actually a reflection of uh, phenomena, or something like that. and so there's a big difference between data yeah. and information. There's a standard view that um, uh, a phenomenon is a pattern in the data. I, I think that's wrong. Um, and uh, there's an equally standard view that uh, data is um, something that can be represented as binary digits. And I think that's wrong as well. I think you have qualitative data as well. The trouble is, when you start to look at it in detail and start to analyse it down, uh, you end up with something that you can represent as an encoding in some sort of a state phase space. So. Um, I don't know that there's a, a distinction to be had here. Some, some of the biggest clients, say in the business world, like the biggest hedge fund manager in the world, works on the principle that, that the human mind, that's a great value. Of it. The human mind is absolutely flawed, even, even Warren Buffett's opinion, etc. Now, given all the possible biases that the human mind has. I understand that it's the scientific process that makes the progress of understanding and you know the build up of individuals. Don't you think that um, if you like even perhaps science reflecting back just about every scientist has been wrong along the way. Um, yes. And we've got to be very careful in terms of saying that we do understand something. Well, understanding, as I say, it's contextual, so you can understand, for example, there were theories of uh, subtle fluids like phlogiston that were uh, accounted for combustion in the early 19th century, late 18th century. Uh, you could understand phlogiston. The fact that it was false is irrelevant. In the context and in the way that it was represented, uh, someone could say they understood it, right? Or, or um, yeah, you know, and and likewise, uh, you can understand. I don't know neoliberal economics. It was mm -hmm. about as false a representation of the world, including the biology of human beings, mm -hmm. uh, as, as is possible to have. But you can understand it, right? It's not understand about the process. It's not about truth. It's about uh, being able to comprehend and make the right cognitive operations on it. So wisdom isn't truth. Understanding <laughs> isn't what is. Uh, Mike, follow up. question. Um, I, I sympathise. I sympathise with your project to um, um, dehumanise understanding. Yeah. If that's what it. If, well, yeah, depersonalise it. Make a sense of. of trying to use compression um, as a mechanism, if you like, to broaden the notion of understanding be beyond the psychological, beyond what happens in humans. Yes. Um, but I wonder if you're flogging a dead horse there in, in so much of, I, I'm thinking here that 
understanding is a bit might be a bit like um, colour comprehension, and, and that is it's innately human. You know, th th this this is red, and I'm and but it's only red for me. It's not red for a frog, and it's not red for a Kodak camera made in 1928. Do, do you know what I mean? I so know what you mean. Yeah. Colour colour comprehension is a humanist. Um, what phenomena, thing, yeah. uh, process, uh, performance, uh, and maybe understanding is a similar thing, and therefore you can't just erase the psychological aspects of it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm struggling to think of what the etymology of understanding is and what the etymology of mm. comprehension is. Well, comprehend so, is a great one because it literally means to hold in your hand. Sorry, say, say again. Comprehend literally means to hold in your hand. It's something oh, okay. that you can okay. quite okay. literally so that's grasp. Humanist. That's humanist too. I'm trying to think yeah. of something that might apply to non-humans um, parallel understanding in humans. Sure, um, and, and I would approach that in terms of the umwelt of the organisms. So, uh, are you familiar with umwelt? Yes, you are, well. right. Yes, yes. Um, the, you know, the, the tick. The ticks. Yes. Yeah. Um, Humans are primates and therefore have a primate umwelt, and I think yeah. we understand things yeah. so far as they are um, something that we can operate on observational information, whether it's for visual, auditory, whatever. Yeah. Um, and but more than that, we're African great apes, and so we have whatever uh, novelties they have, and more than that, we're human beings, so we have whatever novelties they have, but more than that. We're culturally bound, historically bound, socioeconomically bound objects. Yeah, so we have that as well. So the algorithm and a computer system yeah. and so forth. So what is consistent yeah. across all of this is that there is a working memory constraint on all of it. Yeah, whether you're a frog or whether you're a, a physicist. Yeah. Uh, look, John, uh, yeah. holding holding in your hand. Sorry, it's holding in your hand. It's not the logic. Yeah, we, we have to go out of the room. You're right, uh, but I don't think it's going to kill the uh, argument. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so understanding is a big adventure. It is, yes. When I understand it, I'll let you know.